Hello everyone and welcome to another recommends video. In this video, we will be continuing with the second novel in the series, Cities in Flight. The series was written by James Blish and the novel is called A Life for the Stars. There will be a link to a playlist containing the first novel of the series and the first part of this novel at the end of the video. Before we continue, if you haven't subscribed, please consider doing so. Give us a like, drop us a comment, and now, part two. When New York got to heaven, the planet it had a contract with, it landed in the midst of a storm. But according to the locals, there was always a storm going on in heaven, everywhere. And sometimes the storms were worse than this. Chris was sitting on an old pier with Piggy, watching as the city landed. He hadn't seen a storm since he left Earth, and Piggy had never seen a storm. And as they sat there watching, 20 men in space armor came down the pair behind them. One of them was his guardian. He promptly chased the two boys away, saying that they shouldn't be there. Over the next few weeks, Chris went on with his studies. He didn't get much information about what was going on, except the few times that his guardian, Sergeant Anderson, was home when he wasn't busy. And what he did say was that the city is there to help industrialize the planet. But the problem was that the planet had a feudal system and there were 66,000 people that was called the elect that were free landholders. And below them was a large number of serfs that nobody bothered to count. And the archangels, the elect, wanted to keep it that way even after they got their heavy industries established. But the problem was that they are not allowed to change a planet's social system and they can't really complete this contract without starting a revolution. And when the cops come afterward and find out, they'll have a violation to answer for. Whenever he had a chance, Chris would go and watch everything being uncreated and move down onto the planet. The colonists spoke a variant of Russian and Chris would understand them if he concentrated. It seems that what the colonists wanted to do was to set up an economy with undersea farming and herding. And when they set up their own refineries, they'll be able to power metals to other planets. Sergeant Anderson's absences were becoming longer and longer. And since the colonists were beginning to not frequent the city as much, Chris was now not getting as much information as he did before. Then Sergeant Delaney and his partner, Sergeant Anderson, went missing using the knife with the compass in the handle that his father had given him chris was able to bribe one of the colonists to teach him how to drive their boat and while doing that he overheard them talking about how they're planning to betray the city and how they was holding the two generals as hostages meaning that chris's guardian was being held against his will once the boat hit something, he was able to lock the six colonists out of the pilot room and headed for where the homing signal was coming from. He hoped that it was the castle Wolfwit he heard them talking about and he would be able to find Anderson and Delaney there. And he hoped to get there before the six colonists could burn their way back into the room. Chris studied the controls, but he couldn't understand the language around the instruments. That's when he began to regret his impulsive action. He wanted to tell the city what he had found out so they could chase after him, but he had no way of contacting them because he couldn't read the instruments to tell him which one was the communicator. The boat was locked in through the homing signal and was headed straight towards it. He was finally able to see Castle Wolf Whip in the distance. It stood in the middle of a lake, and the boat, when it got to the lake, sank down on the bottom and began crossing on the bottom. The boat finally stopped and the outside lights came on and he could see that the boat was in a berth inside of a cavern. There were men with guns waiting. They took him and put him in the same cell with Sergeant Anderson and Dullany. Anderson and Dullany were not happy to see him because he was a complication. They got disappointed when they realized that Chris had already been interviewed. They were hoping that he would have time to look around and see if there was any spacesuits around. But he did notice too, which made them happy. The two sergeants waited until lights out, picked the lock, knocked out the guard that was at the door, 
bundled him into the cell and told Chris to wait here and that they'll be back. The two sergeants created havoc in the castle, collapsed in one of the floors, then came back and got Chris. And although their suits could fly, they didn't have one for Chris, so they utilized his boat to get back to the city. Anderson and Chris rode in the boat while Delaney flew ahead. Then he told Chris, now comes the riot act. It turns out that Chris had interfered and made things worse. After reading him the riot act, in the end, they gave him marks for imagination and boldness, as well as coolness on the fire. And the new contract was negotiated. It was a much more limited one, only lasting three months. And since they only had Chris's word for what he overheard about them planning to steal the city, that would not stand up in any colonial court. After that, Chris stayed away from the docks. Piggy, of course, thought that Chris got a raw deal. He found out that they were going to steal the city, and he let the city fathers know, and they didn't do anything for him. To Piggy's mind, what happened to Chris proves that the city doesn't mean what it says about gaining citizenship. Then Chris asked him, what if you're wrong? Then you'll be stuck as a passenger for the rest of your life, and that would be a normal lifetime. That was when Piggy told him the legend of the lost city. It was a city that had taken off from Earth and had gotten lost and ran out of food and medicine, everything. And they found a planet that was slightly bigger than Earth, but with the same gravity. And on that planet, they found a grain growing that contained an anti-death drug, a better one that they didn't have to extract. All they had to do was make bread out of it. So the citizens of that city stayed on the planet and they would send their city out to meet with other cities. And when they did, they would collect all of the passengers on those cities and bring them back to the planet. When Chris left Piggy, he hopped into a public information booth and asked for the librarian and he asked a question, do any anti-death drugs grow naturally? Do they occur in plants and could be raised as crops? It answered him that part of the drugs did come from plants, but it had to be converted. And then it went on to tell him about a legendary planet that has never been found on which these drugs grow in crops. When he got home, he told his guardians about the legend he heard and that amused them. He also told them how he tried to trick the librarian, which is one of the city fathers, with a trick question, and it didn't work. And Anderson went on to tell him that the city fathers, who are computers, AIs, have been given absolute power in certain areas, that they can't forbid the mayor anything, but if he goes against their judgment, then they can revoke his office. And he's quite certain that the city fathers are safe because there's over a hundred of them and they check and repair each other. There are legends that there have been towns where city fathers had run amok, but they're only stories. He goes on to tell him about another legend in which cities prey on other cities, which of course they have no proof that that happens. And those cities are called Bindlestiff. He then told Chris the last story in which it was about a vegan obelisk fort that got away and it was never found and the legend says that it is devouring cities as a way to survive. Then Anderson questioned Chris on the meaning of those legends and was impressed by Chris's answer. The city fathers was pushing Chris hard. They were loading so much information into his head that he was beginning to feel sick. But he was determined not to go to medical because he didn't want to put in jeopardy his chance of getting his citizenship. And since he didn't want to worry his guardians, he decided he would go and speak to Dr. Brazilla, his human teacher, to get her advice. She told him that she'd seen this sort of thing before, that the city fathers are driving him hard because they suspect he has a talent and they're trying to find it. And she told him that he has to stick it out until they find out what his talent is, and no one can help him. He must do it alone. He must stick it out. And what the city fathers was pushing into his head right now was history, interstellar history, whole systems of world history. He couldn't figure out why they was pushing so much history into his head because they would always know more history than he could ever learn. So Chris didn't think he was making any progress, 
and as far as he could see, neither was Piggy. Then one day, Sergeant Anderson told him that the mayor wanted to speak to him. It seems that the mayor had taken a new contract from a planet called August 3. They are the second city to come to this planet, and the colonists let slip that the other city was still on the planet. And it seems that the city fathers have analyzed the situation and come to the conclusion that that other city has landed on the planet and taken over. And it would seem that the colonists are offering a huge amount of money, $63 million in metal, to help them get rid of the city. Now, typically, they are supposed to let the cops come and handle this, but the mayor and the city fathers, because of the money being offered, don't want to turn this opportunity down. And the reason the mayor wants Chris to listen in when he speaks to the planet is because the city that has taken over is Scranton, his old city. So the city fathers questioned him about what he knew about Scranton. And one day he was pulled out of class because they wanted him to listen while the mayor spoke to Scranton. At first, Scranton tried to pretend that they were the colonists from August Street, but the mayor of New York let them know he knew who they were. Chris recognized both men. One was the fellow that killed his brother's dog when they were still on earth. And the second was Frank Lutz, who was the city manager of Scranton. Frank, of course, threatened New York if they dared to come to the planet. Once they were finished speaking, they warned Chris that they were going to keep him out of Frank's sight and they were going to make sure that he did not leave the city. As New York began landing on the planet August 3, the planet reminded Chris of Pennsylvania. New York landed just over the horizon from Scranton, and there was a mountain range in between them. Chris figured that Amalfi, the mayor, had landed New York there so that Scranton would not be able to see what they were doing and to prevent foot traffic between the two cities. Chris believed that Amalfi's plan was to have New York outperform Scranton, but he didn't think that plan was going to work. So he brought it up to his guardian, Sergeant Anderson. He told Sergeant Anderson that the very fact that Scranton is here on this planet instead of where the mayor had directed them to go in the first place shows that something went wrong with their first job. Anderson asked the city fathers how accurate Chris was on that, and they told him 72%. Chris went on to say that no matter how good our strategy is, it has to be on the assumption that the other side is going to act logically, but desperate men never behave logically. And Scranton would be desperate because this would be their second failure in a row, and it would be very low on supplies. Chris goes on to say, that he doesn't think that Frank Lutz will let anybody bluff him. He will fight first because if he fails, somebody else will take over for him. And Chris figures that the people of Scranton must be desperate by now and that New York could use that desperation to get the people of Scranton to kick Frank Lutz out. So things went on as they were for a while. And in the last week of New York City's contract with the planet, Piggy managed to sneak over to Scranton with two women. They hoped to be able to convince Scranton that they had defected and somehow, once they're there, overthrow Lutz. Of course, that didn't work and Lutz captured them and is now holding them ransom, demanding that New York give them the planet. Chris knew that whatever Amalfi and the city fathers were planning wouldn't work because they are underestimating how mean Frank Lutz was. And he had less than a week to try and save Piggy and the two girls from death. He couldn't bring his plan up to the city fathers because they wouldn't let him do it, so he decided he would sneak over to Scranton and do his plan himself. When Chris left and headed for Scranton, he took with him a home in Compass. These were compasses that were designed to home in on the nearest spin dizzy field. When cities landed on planets, they tend to keep a fractional field going to prevent local air from mixing with the city air. When Chris finally got to Scranton, he was able to trick the guards and they let him in. That was based on his knowledge of Scranton and he went straight to his hidey hole to wait. It was an hour after the end of the workday 
that he heard someone coming, and it turned out to be Frad. After they greeted each other, Frad told him that it was a hunch and he wasn't sure that he would make it. He also told him that they were holding the three New Yorkers and he wasn't going to be able to rescue them. Chris came to an agreement with Frad so that Frad could take out Frank. After several days, Frad came back looking a lot worse. He confirmed that they had gotten rid of Frank, but he wouldn't say how or what happened to him. Now Chris was nervous because now he'd have to go and tell the mayor what he did or what he committed them to and he wasn't sure how they were going to react. Later, Chris was in the Empire State Building at the mayor's office with Frad and Sergeants Anderson and Delaney. The mayor had upheld the deal that Chris made with Frad and he added that they would help build Scranton its own city fathers. And they would also underwrite Scranton's contract with the planet. And also, this was Chris's 18th birthday, the day when he would either become a citizen or remain a passenger. The mayor then offered Chris a job, the job of city manager. In the meantime, the city fathers were going to put him on five years probation in which time he would be able to learn the skill needed to do that job. Chris accepted the job and with that he became a citizen and would start on anti-death drugs with his next meal. It also turns out that Piggy was going to remain a passenger. That's when Fred Hoskins, the new city manager of Scranton, shook his hand and said, colleague, let's talk business. And that's how the book ends. I want to thank you for watching and listening. I appreciate it. And I will see you in the next video.